Hello and welcome to this presentation. What is a derivative? Now a derivative can be described as a financial contract which derives its value from movements in an underlying asset. The underlying asset could be for example some barrels of oil, it could be some shares in a company, it could be some government bonds, it could be various other commodities like coffee and cocoa. So a simple derivative then is a financial contract which tracks the price movement of an underlying asset. Now examples of derivatives include those derivatives that are listed or traded on exchanges, derivatives exchanges, and we refer to those types of derivatives as futures and options or listed derivatives. Derivatives that trade away from the exchange in the so-called over-the-counter market include forwards and an important subset of the forward type of derivative are swaps and swaps can be based upon things like interest rates, currencies, the credit of a, an organization or government and we can also have options traded in the over-the-counter market and these types of options tend to be slightly more complex than the ordinary or plain vanilla type of options listed on exchanges. These over-the-counter options are sometimes referred to as exotic options. A type of option that also trades in the over-the-counter market and sometimes gets listed on exchanges as well are known as warrants and these come in the form of company warrants or covered warrants. Now derivatives themselves are nothing new, they've been around for well over uh, 2,000 years, in fact the, the first recorded instance of an option dates back to 300 years BC. Throughout the centuries they've been used to manage different types of market risk or price risk and in recent times these types of derivatives have also been used to manage slightly more esoteric types of risks such as carbon emissions or credit. So derivatives can be used to manage risk otherwise known as hedging but derivatives can also be used to um, speculate. Speculators are attracted to derivatives because they allow the participant to get greater exposure to the price movements of the underlying assets for a very very small uh, capital outlay and we'll look at some examples of the uses of derivatives a little bit later on which will also include the use of derivatives for arbitrage purposes. Now the classic definition of an arbitrage is that it involves a series of simultaneous transactions which allow the participant to lock in a risk-free profit. So later on we'll look at examples of how certain types of derivatives are used to manage risk, speculate and arbitrage. We're going to look at the, the basic definition now of a futures contract and a future we know is listed on a derivatives exchange and futures are described as being an agreement between two parties where one party agrees to deliver and the other party agrees to take delivery of a fixed quantity and quality of a particular underlying asset. So for example that could be some barrels of particular crude oil or a basket of some particular shares. And notice that the futures contract fixes a day in the future when delivery takes place. Now futures contracts have limited number of days usually in the future when delivery can take place. The idea is that you create a standardized futures contract and limit the amount of deliverable days, therefore focusing a lot of attention and interest from various parties Therefore, this generally leads to an increase in buyers and sellers. Therefore, you get tight bid offer spreads for the futures contracts. In other words, this creates liquidity. And liquidity is very useful, of course, for hedges, speculators, and arbitrages alike. Now, futures, as we mentioned, can be based upon different types of underlying assets like equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities. Futures can also be described as being either physically settled or cash settled. Now, a physically settled contract simply means that if you take out a futures contract today, for example, you buy a futures contract, let's say for September settlement, and we're in the month of March, then if you hold the futures position until the last day in the life of the futures contract, then you are required to take delivery of the pre-specified underlying asset 
So you know the quality of the underlying asset and the quantity and of course the delivery day. In a cash settled futures contract, when you get to the last day in the life of the futures contract, no actual underlying asset is delivered. Instead, the buyer and the seller of the futures contract are going to be cash compensated during the life of the futures contract through the process of variation margin. Now in other presentations we explain how the role of variation margin affects the futures contract. Now it's also worth noting of course that even with physically settled futures contracts variation margin still um, occurs. So again in other presentations we look at how the involvement of variation margin and trade in the futures contracts enables participants to either hedge or arbitrage or speculate with these instruments. Here we're going to look at a generic example of a futures contract. Futures contracts are often described in terms of their unit of trading or contract size. In this example we're going to design a futures contract based upon the ultimate delivery of let's say 1,000 units of, for example, shares in a particular company, or it could be a 1,000 barrels of oil, or a 1,000 tonnes of a particular commodity. The contract will also specify, as I mentioned earlier on, whether it is physically settled or cash settled. So in this example, we'll assume that this particular futures contract requires us to either make or take physical delivery of, let's say, 1,000 shares of a particular company. If it's cash settled of course what we're really saying is that the futures contract is a notional contract to deliver or take delivery of an underlying asset. But whether it's physical or cash settled it can still be used for purposes of both speculation and hedging as well. And of course arbitrage. The futures contract will tend to specify specific months of delivery where they tend to be quite limited. For example, this particular futures contract may say that delivery can only take place on the third Wednesday, for example, of the month of March, June, September and December of a given year. So you have limited number of deliveries available, but what that does, as we mentioned earlier on, it focuses the trading and the action so that liquidity tends to be pretty high for these contracts which of course is an advantage for all participants enable them to easily get into the market and out of the market. The price of the futures contract has to be quoted and in this example we can see here that the futures price is going to be quoted in dollars and cents expressed per one unit of the underlying asset. With futures, we also use the expression tick size and tick value. Now a tick in futures language simply means this is the smallest amount by which the futures price is permitted to move. So in this example, we can see here that the smallest quotation price for a futures contract is 0.01 of a dollar. For example, let's suppose that the futures contract was trading at say $7. If the futures price was observed to go up by one small price incremental movement, then the new price would be $7.01. Now, how would that um, translate into terms of actual profit and loss? Well, we can see here that the tick value to the participant in the market is really $10. And the reason for that, of course, is because the individual futures price is being quoted on a per one unit basis. So if we scale up the small futures price movement, the tick size 0 0.01 by a factor of 1000 which is the futures contract size or lot size then that gives you the value of $10. So just to summarize then a futures contract is a standardized agreement to make or take delivery of an underlying asset on the assumption of course that it's physically settled and we can see here that the unit of trading is fixed, the delivery months are known in advance, and the tick size and tick value is also uh, standardized. In this little section here, we can see how easy it is, because futures contracts are standardized, to be able to work out the profit and loss on the trade, or your hedge benefit, for example. So let's take this simple example. Suppose today we buy four 
futures contracts or four lots at a price of say 90 00. And after a while, the futures price changes to 90.25. We decide to sell back the futures contracts in the market because, of course, futures contracts being highly standardized enables participants to go into the market and offset any existing positions. In other presentations, we explain how, through the role of the clearinghouse, this is uh, facilitated. So in this example, have we made a profit or a loss? Well, to work out the profit and loss on a futures contract, we simply need to work out the tick movement times the tick value times the number of lots. So in this example, the futures price has moved by 25 ticks. Notice we don't write it down as 0 0.25, but just 25. We then multiply that by the tick value, which we saw from the previous slide was $10. And then we multiply that by the number of futures contracts that we've actually traded. And that gives us a net profit of $1,000. Now, this is sometimes referred to as the futures variation margin. And of course, that's your profit, for example, if you were speculating, or that might be your hedge benefit, for example, if you're using futures to hedge. So just to summarize then, futures contracts being standardized, it means it's very easy then to be able to work out what the gains and losses are associated with them.